to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 20, the Bible says that our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. Truly, the Christian serves an awesome God. We welcome you to our study today, and in today's lesson we're thinking about, related to the nature of our awesome God, our God, our awesome God has spoken. How wonderful it is today to know that not only do we serve an awesome God, but that God has revealed His full and complete message to each and every one of us. Friend, we're so glad that you've joined us for our study together today. We want you to know that we're happy that you're here, and we look forward to joining together in study in the future as well. Uh, we'd like to invite you. Today's lessons are being brought to you by members and congregations of the Church of Christ in your area. We'd like to invite you to visit the Church of Christ in your area. You'll find people in the Lord's Church who love the Lord, who are concerned about souls and who want men and women to go to heaven. You can visit their assembly on Sunday or Wednesday and you'd be an honored guest. If you've got questions about God or the plan of salvation or, or worship, they'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you. Friend, we'd also be happy to help you in your study and in your journey to know God better here at the Gospel of Christ. Won't you check out our website? thegospelofchrist.com. We have a plethora of good Bible study material that is available free of charge to you from our website. Audio lessons, video lessons, transcripts, study questions, just a host of good Bible study material, and it's all free. And on top of that, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson, uh, you can download that free from our website or We'll be happy to send it to you in a hard copy as well on DVD or CD. Just fill out the media request form or you can call us or write to us and we'll be glad to help you. And friend, check out our apps in both the Apple and Android store that are available to use on your smartphone. And that's a great way in our fast-paced world to study the Word of God on the go. In Jeremiah 37, verse number 17, an evil king asked a great question. Is there any word from the Lord? And friend, of the, all the questions that are found in the, of the some 2,000 questions that are found in the Bible, outside of the greatest question, what must I do to be saved? What an awesome question this is for men and women everywhere to ask. Paul repeated this same sentiment in Romans 4 verse 3 when he said, What does the Scripture say? And friend, I assure you, this is a, a very important and an extremely needed question and subject for today. How do we know that? A May 2017 Gallup research poll revealed this, that only 24% of Americans believe that this book is the literal Word of God, meaning that 24% of us believe this book is from God it literally means what it says, and I must obey it to be right with God. You know, sometimes I wonder, how did the world and how did America get in the shape that it's in today? Well, friend, if only 24% believe this is the literal Word of God, that explains a few things. But you know, this is not only a needed subject because of the confusion on this idea. This is such a needed subject because the Christ, if I believe this as a child of God, the, this is going to give the Christian great confidence in the Bible as the Word of God and in His salvation. Here's what's great about having the revelation from God. 1 John 5 verse 13 says, These things we write to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in His name. Friend, as I put more faith and confidence in the Bible, the more I have confidence in my salvation. And friend, please understand, 
the things we're going to talk about today, they're not hard to understand. Ephesians 3 verse 4 says, When you read, you can understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Do not be ignorant, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And as Jesus said in John 8 verse 32, you can know the truth and the truth will make you free. As we think about our awesome God and His wonderful revelation to mankind, let's realize that in answer to the question of Jeremiah 37, Jeremiah 37 verse 17, is there any word from the Lord? Uh, the Word of God, the Bible, gives a resounding yes to that question. The Bible is our awesome revelation from our awesome God. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16 and 17, the Scripture says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for approval, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. This book is inspired of God. Now someone says, inspired, what's that mean? Is that kind of like... When uh, Shakespeare was inspired to write a play, he was kind of... No, that's not the idea. Inspired doesn't mean great motivation. The Greek word for inspired or inspiration is a compound word of literally two Greek words. It is the Greek word theopanoustos. And here's what that means. The Greek word for God is theos, God. Then the word panoustos literally is the word for breathe, but it's even more detailed than that. It's the word for exhale. God, what does it mean when we say the Bible is inspired? Theopanustos, God exhaled. And on His breath that came out of His mouth were the very words of the Bible. Friend, doesn't that put a beautiful picture on our awesome revelation? 2 Peter 1 verses 19 through 21 tells us what the force behind even the human scribes writing that with pen and ink were. The Bible says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. What was that moving or driving force? The end result of the Bible, my friends, is the words of the Holy Spirit of our awesome God. Then we think of the words of 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, where the Bible says, If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things which I write to you. These are the commands of God. And so the, the Bible, this is not man's ideas, man, man's thoughts, what some man somewhere wanted people to do. This is the very Word of God. But friend, along with inspiration, and along with the Bible being our Word from the Lord, let's also realize this book is truth. There's a Bible passage that I'd like for you to think about with me as it relates to this idea of truth. And it's found in Psalm 119, Verse 160, the entirety of your word is truth and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. You know, Pilate asked a question that many people are asking today. In John 18, 36, Pilate said, what is truth? Little did he know Jesus had already answered that in his prayer. In John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Friend, we live in a world where a lot of people are confused as to what's true and right. But one thing you can rest assured of, this book is absolute truth. To his disciples, Jesus said in John 16, verse 13, And when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, listen to this now, he'll guide you into all truth. For you'll not speak on your own authority, he'll not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he'll tell you in essence. Friend, we have. All truth today. Say, I love, there's two verses I think of when I think of the absolute truth of God's Word. Jude 3, Jude said, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith, listen now, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Here's what's wonderful. We have all truth. We have the once, one time, for all. Revelation. God gave it once for everybody. How wonderful it is to know that's the Word of God we have today. And friend, it completely equips us. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, God's given to us all things for life and godliness. And so when we think about 
our awesome God and His awesome revelation. How wonderful it is to know this book is from God. This book is absolute truth. And friend, if I'll do what it says, if I love it, obey it, and live my life by it, I'll be saved. Romans 1.16 says the gospel is God's power unto salvation. James 1 verse 21, but receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save our souls. Now let's think about another idea as it relates to our awesome God and His awesome revelation, and it's this. Let's realize that this awesome revelation is our absolute authority on all matters of religion. Friend, we're living in a day and age where there's a dire need for people to realize there is a structure of authority. So many people have the idea that nobody's going to tell me how to do my life, nobody's going to tell me how to do things, and nobody's going to be my boss. Well, friend, realize it or not, man did not create God. God created man. And as a creation of God, I'm responsible. I'm amenable to Him. Genesis 1 verse 27, God said, Let us make man in our image. And then there's this passage I want you to see. In Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, that illustrates this idea so beautifully. The Word of God says in Genesis 2 verse 7, The Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. He is the father of our spirits. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 9. And one day we're all going to stand before the throne of God, throne of Christ, and give an account. Romans chapter 14, verse number 12. But as we think about the Bible as our authority, there's a few passages I'd like to mention today that really illustrate that our awesome revelation is our authority. It's the guide that we live our life by today. The first is found in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18. I want you to notice the words of Jesus in Matthew 28, verse number 18. Jesus said this, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he would say, Go and make disciples of all nations. Who is it that has all authority? Does some religious leader in some foreign country today have all authority? Does the head of some church today have all authority? Man-made church today have all authority? Do men, do elders, do preachers? Who has all authority in matters of doctrine today? Jesus Christ has all authority. Friends, He's still the head of the church. The Lord's church does not need a human head. It is, the church has not been decapitated. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, He is the head of the church. He still is the head of the church, which is His body. And then, friend, I want you to think about another passage that illustrates the idea of our awesome revelation being our authority. And that's John 12, verse 48. I want you to look in your Bible in John chapter 12, verse 48 with me and notice what the Word of God says. Jesus said this, He who rejects me and does not receive my word has that which judges him. The word that I have spoken will judge him in the last day. You can reject Jesus. You can reject His plan. You can reject His love and His mercy and His grace. But friend, you're still going to stand before the almighty throne of God and be judged by our awesome revelation. Proverbs 30 verse 6 says, Do not add to his word, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. It's not up for edit. Do not add to nor take away. Revelation 22 verses 18 and 9, Whoever transgresses and goes beyond the doctrine of Christ does not have God. 2 John 9. And so when we think about this idea, the Bible is complete. It's all truth. It's our absolute authority, and it is not open for edit. It's, and friend, that's not a bad thing. Listen carefully. The Bible as our authority is not a bad, negative, depressing uh, way of life that's trying to keep you from having fun. Friend, when I realize this book is God's Word, and it's my guide in life, that's actually helpful because... 
if I do what it says, then friend, I can be 100% sure I'm doing what God wants. If I live the way God, the way the Bible says I need to live, then I know I can be right with God. And friend, if I do what the Bible says I've got to do to be saved, I can know, not think, not wonder, not guess. I can know that I'm right with God. And when that final curtain falls and when the Lord appears, if I've lived by the Bible, then I know I'll hear these words. Well done, good and faithful servant enter into the joys of your Lord. That's not discouraging. That's encouraging. That offers help and hope and encouragement for every child of God today. All right, as we think then about these ideas and as we think about our awesome God and His awesome revelation, let's also realize that in our awesome revelation, we learn about the church that Jesus built. Is there any word from the Lord? You bet there is. And there's word on the church that Jesus built. Friend, I hope you'll understand the way I'm saying this. It is a privilege beyond measure to be a part of the church Jesus died for. The Bible says in Colossians 3 verse 15, and you were called into one body and be ye thankful. Acts 20 verse 28, Jesus purchased the church with his own blood. I'm not talking today about a man-made denomination I'm not talking about some religious group somebody else started somewhere else that does 101 things that you don't find in the Bible. Friend, I'm talking about the church that when Jesus hung on the cross, He died for. We're talking about that unique church that He called His own. Let me illustrate that for you. Would you take your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 16? And I want you to see what Jesus said about His church. In Matthew 16, the disciples have questioned Jesus, uh, or Jesus has asked them, Who do men say that I am? Some Elijah, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, one of the other prophets. And then he says to Peter, But who do you say that I am? And I want you to notice, as Peter says, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Directly following that monumental, blockbuster, foundational statement, Jesus says these words. In Matthew 16, verse number 18, Jesus said, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Friend, when we talk about the church, we're talking about the one church that belongs to the Lord. The one body, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 4. The, the foundation of that church is built on the teachings of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 3 verse number 11. And... I know as well as you as we look around, it seems as though there is a man-made religious group nearly on every street corner. But friend, hear me well today. That's not the way God intended it. You want to know the way God intended it? 1 Corinthians 12 verse 20 says this, There are many members, now listen to the emphatic statement here, There are many members, yet but one body. What's the body? The body's the church. Ephesians 1, verse 22 and 23. There are many members, yet but one church. That's the teaching we find in the Bible. Denominationalism was never God's plan. Paul said, I, I marvel that you're so soon removed from Him who called you to the grace of Christ to another gospel. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. And then we hear the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 13. He said, let there be no divisions among you. And so the idea of division and denominationalism, friend, that's just not a part of God's plan. All right, let's then think about our awesome revelation as it relates to the subject of sin and salvation. Sometimes if I'm sitting at home watching TV, I'll flip through the channels and I'll see a lot of popular religious uh, leaders speaking on various subjects. And I remember recently uh, hearing an interview, I think it was done by Larry King, Bill O'Reilly, and he spoke with Oprah Winfrey about it as well. And one of the more popular religious leaders, Joel Osteen, one of the things he said that made his religious group and his movement so popular was, he said, I don't mention hell, I don't mention judgment, and I don't mention the idea of sin. Well, friend, please understand me well today, and I hope you'll understand this real carefully. You can't say anything about a Savior without saying something about sin. Isn't that right? Savior, save from what? And there we are. 
let's realize that our wonderful revelation from God tells us about sin and salvation. Now, let's think about the subject of sin for just a moment, for it's something that all men of an accountable age have to deal with. Romans 3 verse 10, the Bible says, there's none righteous, no, not one. In and of ourselves, we can't be righteous because of sin. Well, what's that mean? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 3, verse number 23. In fact, the Bible goes as far as to say in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 20 that there's not a righteous man on the face of the earth who does good and does not sin. Even the most righteous have to deal with the sin problem. And so everyone who has a right mind of an accountable age has to deal with the sin problem. It's universal. But it's not just the universal nature of sin that we want to think about. It's what sin does to our relationship with God that makes it so awful. Would you take your Bible and look with me in Isaiah chapter 59? And I want you to notice what the Scripture says in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, on the effects of sin. The Bible records this. In Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, Scripture says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor His ear heavy, that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. What does sin do that's so damaging? Friend, when I, when I do things I know that are not right, when I miss the mark of what God wants me to do, and I do things that are wrong, let's be honest today. We may not, people may not like to hear it, but sin separates us from God. If we're separated from God, then we're lost and we're without hope. And so please realize the damaging effects of sin. Ezekiel 18.4 says the soul who sins will surely die. The wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6 verse number 23. And friend, long ago the proverb writer said in Proverbs 13 verse 15, the way of the sinner is hard. You will never find a more depressing, discouraging, and eternally damning way of life than a life of sin. But now, having mentioned that, here's the good news. Our awesome God, in His awesome revelation, has revealed to us the cure to the sin problem. In Matthew chapter 1, verses 19 through 21, uh, they are told, Jesus' parents are told, you will call His name Jesus. What's that mean? He will save His people from their sins. The good news is there is a Savior from the sin problem, and His name is Jesus. You see, the real heart of God, sometimes people think of God in a wrong aspect. Sometimes people think that because there is a place called hell, God wants people to go there. Friend, that is, the, that is not true. You want to know the real heart of God? God wants all men to be saved. 1 Timothy 2 verse 4. God doesn't want anyone to perish. 2 Peter 3 verse 9. And so God in His infinite wisdom has made a plan of salvation to save man from the sin problem. Well, how's that possible? Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Hebrews 9, verse 22. Under the Old Testament, the blood of bulls and goats, they could never really take away sin. But you know what? The Bible clearly teaches that Jesus can. He Himself bore in His own body our sins upon the tree that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. Listen to the words of Matthew 26, 28. As Jesus took that, that fruit of the vine, and as they drank of that, He told them, This is my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Friend, there's no doubt the Bible has a lot to say about sin, but the Bible also has a lot to say about salvation. Here's what we hope you're thinking about today. The single greatest question that's ever asked in the Bible I hope it's on your mind today. Do you know what that question is? In Acts 16, there was a jailer who was watching over Paul and Silas. And uh, God opened the gates of that jail. And the man knew his life. If those prisoners escaped, he knew his life was going to be forfeited. And so he took his sword and he started to commit suicide. But before he did, 
he heard these encouraging words. Sir, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. And with a little glimmer of hope, that man asked the greatest question in the world. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Have you thought about that question seriously with an eye toward eternity? Are you a child of God? What must a person do to be saved? Well, friend, as we've been highlighting in our lesson today, you've got to hear the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10, verse number 17. Having heard that Word, I must put my faith in it and believe it. Jesus said in John 8, verse 24, Unless you believe that I am He, you'll surely die in your sins having committed to this as true and right and what I want to live my life by. And friend, I've got to do what it says and repent of sin. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Having repented of sin, would you make the good confession that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? Romans 10, verse 10 says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and listen to this, and with the mouth confession is made, unto salvation. Just like the Ethiopian eunuch, we want to say, I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Acts 8, verse 36 and 37. And friend, to contact that saving blood of Jesus that we spoke about. And as we mentioned, to have every sin washed away and to be saved. The Bible teaches you must be baptized. Listen to these verses. Paul was told in Acts 22, 16, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 2 Peter 3, verse 21, verse 20 and 21, Peter said, Baptism does now also save us. Jesus said it so plainly. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. And when Peter preached the gospel for the very first time, he told men and women to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And then we must walk in newness of life every day. Romans chapter 6, verse number 4. Friend, we hope today that we've each been encouraged by our awesome God and His awesome revelation, and we encourage you to join us next time as we'll think more about our awesome God. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, as well as video and audio from our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. You can also reach us by emailing mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call us at 844-6-GOSPEL or write to us at the address on your screen. You can also get our Gospel of Christ app on your handheld devices for those on the go.